Eddie Jobson. Well, for me, he is to music what, I don't know, saffron is to cooking. Doesn't show up all that often, but tend to really enjoy it when I come across something. Over the years, I've heard his contributions to Roxy Music. Frank Zappa, including an appearance on Saturday Night Live. UK. Jethro Tull. Uh, the inclusion of Eddie Jobson really gave them a fresh sound on a new album at the dawn of the 80s that was called A. I've seen some live footage of him with King Crimson. The uh, Lark's Tongues and Aspic and Starless and Bible Black. Those particular albums had David Cross playing uh, violin on those. His inclusion uh, really makes this era stand on its own. It's unique, you know. The early Crimson had saxophone and woodwinds. That was all gone and replaced with violin for a few albums. There's that one solo album I know him from. Uh, the Green Album, with the great Gary Green from Gentle Giant on guitar. Yee! I'm not gonna lie to you. That's a healthy piece of real estate. But I don't know anything about his work with Curved Air. Curved Air is an English progressive rock group that was formed in 1970 with artists from mixed backgrounds, including classical, folk, and electronic. The group evolved out of an earlier group called Sisyphus. The resulting sound of the band is a mixture of prog rock, folk rock, and fusion, with classical elements sprinkled in as well. Curved Air released eight studio albums. The first of three broke the UK Top 20. It even had a hit single with Backstreet Love in 1971. It reached number four in the singles chart. Looking at the personnel on Aircut, the only other name I kind of recognize is Kirby Gregory. And not because I've ever heard his music, but because... If I have the name right, he was one of the folks that performed live as Fleetwood Mac in the early 70s after the real band couldn't get their act together to complete a tour. It's just one of those stories that gets passed around in music communities, right? Like the B.B. King Kino story, or the tapes of Buddy Rich bitching out his band. I think I remember hearing that Stuart Copeland played in Curved Air once upon a time, too but he's not on this album. No, I definitely can't infer anything about Curved Air based on what I've heard of Eddie Jobson alone, especially since this album predates anything else I know him from. I bet there'll be some violin. That's something, right? The violin is an interesting instrument in that it rules the roost in the classical world. It's probably the first instrument you think of when you think of classical music. But take it in a different context, such as a rock band or a jazz fusion band, and its effect is quite different, all while bringing a bit of a classical tinge to whatever it's involved in. I think it's worth noting that it wasn't even an option, really, to play a violin with a loud rock band until something called the Barkus Berry Pickup came along. As I'm sure many violinists know, trying to hear yourself in front of a loud rock band is not easy. Playing the violin is all about great intonation guided by your ear. If you can't hear yourself because the band is roaring away behind you, then you're blown out in the weeds. But what if the violin could suddenly be as loud as a martial amp? Well, that changes everything. Some of the most unique Groups from the 70s featured violin, including the Electric Light Orchestra, which included a violinist and two cellists. Jefferson Starship, you probably wouldn't think of them as a violin group, but Papa John Creech put some interesting playing on their albums. And of course, probably the most obvious progressive rock band from the 70s from America, Kansas. Robbie Steinhardt kind of set the template, followed up by his successor, David Ragsdale, who plays with them to this day. No 
doubt one of the greatest of the uh, electric violinists of the early 70s and beyond was John Luke Ponty, who played originally with Frank Zappa. And also went on to play with the Mahavishnu Orchestra. <laughs> Also, I'd like to mention a couple of my favorite players, including Alan Sloan from the Dixie Dregs. Alan Sloan violin. And Jerry Goodman from the original version of the Mahavishnu Orchestra. <laughs> Another group you might not think of right away when you think about violin is Gentle Giant. Those guys were so adept at playing so many different instruments, it might have passed you by. But Ray Shulman, the bassist, was also a great violinist, and it crops up on a number of songs throughout their catalog. Well, I'm certainly hearing moments that have arrangement and harmonic qualities of early 70s British progressive rock. There's also some Fairport Convention slash Steel Eye Span style British folk rock moments. But on this first spin, the overwhelming vibe I'm getting from Aircut is early 70s harder rock stuff. Maybe along the lines of John Rutsey era Rush, or maybe Rick Derringer and Edgar Winter. Maybe even Robin Trower. That certainly would explain the cover art. The other thing I noticed is that some of the hooks on this album would be great for sampling and looping. The opening riff of the Purple Speed Queen, for example. I could definitely see that in a halftime context. The chord changes in the chorus, though. It's pretty close to Rush's Working Man to my ears, only a bit faster. And, and let me say this, if we can agree that a chesty female voice in a performance that emphasizes cadenzas and a demonstration of vocal range typifies a certain type of American R&B, then I think a performance that emphasizes only a strong melody and a hint of melancholy, and then the curly -haired elfin boy smile. that style belongs to British folk rock, or else to British progressive rock depending on whether they're singing about the lad they left back home or a magical child alone in a glade. I bet you can't guess which one Elfin Boy is about. Metamorphosis goes a lot of places, starting with a Franz Liszt style bit of piano work, then a march for snare drum, organ, and guitar swells, and eventually bass. And this sets the mood but not necessarily the groove for the structure of the verses, because the groove kind of lives in a space between ELP's Karn Evil 9 and the Underture from Tommy. <laughs> Lovely bit of piano work in 11.8 after the first verse, which it kind of expands into its own little sub-composition with lyrics and a counter melody. Then a guitar solo kind of event over a dirgy set of organ-heavy chords, which abruptly transitions back to the marchy bits. It just seems to me that they could have made that a bit less awkward, don't you think? Another verse, followed by a keyboard showcase thing with synths, organ, and piano. Yeah, none of the solos on side one feel all that spontaneous. Well, I wouldn't say none of them do, because the violin fills on world are awfully jazzy. <laughs> evokes Stefan Grappelli more than a bit. I could see postmodern jukebox doing this one. And on to side two, beginning with Armin, an instrumental track which acts mainly as a showcase for violin and guitar. And here we finally start to see everyone reaching for some intensity in their improvisation. Side two starting off strong. And for me, it only gets stronger with UHF. Weird Al Yankovic in UHF. UHF is easily my favorite song on this album. Starts off with a great riff. <laughs> Leads
leading into a really catchy verse. Very nearly funky, even. Then there's another kind of awkward transition between the verse and the middle slower section, just a fade out, fade in thing. But they do transition it back to the main riff perfectly. I bet that one would be great to play live. 232 has the feel of a bombastic early 70s rock tune, but there's something about the song structure and the chord voicings that makes me think it would make a passable Grateful Dead low energy jam. <laughs> And that last tune, Easy, this was not my favorite song on the album. Honestly, it reminded me of early 70s hippie style Broadway. Maybe like the number from an Andrew Lloyd Webber musical where the pure hearted young hero finds himself in the drug den of a seductive miscreant who's convinced he has money or something and so she's trying to seduce him so she can rip him off while he's asleep. That bridge in 5-4 was pretty cool though. My initial impression, there are a couple of tunes on this album I really like. There are a few others that if you played them for me in the car, I'd be perfectly content. And there's one that I'd skip entirely. But who knows, maybe with repeated listens, easy will get easier. <laughs> I liked this album better before I started paying attention to the lyrics. My first few listens, it was the rockers like the Purple Speed Queen and UHF that really caught my attention. Like I said, there's a great feel to these tunes. Very strong early Rush vibes. I dig that. But the first time I sat down to critically listen to the vocals, man, some of them are pretty awkward. <laughs> she took an overdose. She didn't feel tired at all. And when she died, the doctor said she just couldn't take any more. That's kind of cheesy, right? I mean, Purple Speed Queen and Easy are the worst offenders, I think. But there's more to it than that. Sonia Christina's voice is so piping and clear and ethereal. Very much in the tradition of singers like Sandy Denny, Linda Thompson, and Christine McVie. And I don't know, maybe it's me? But that's not the vocal style I'd choose for songs about hard rock and drug using party times. Even if it does end with an overdose. Which now that I think of it is very British folk rock. The other thing that kind of brought me down a bit the more I listened was Kirby Gregory's guitar work. Not because I didn't like it, but because it seemed to me that for a good portion of the album he was holding himself back, playing safe. On Armin... The instrumental that starts side two, you can hear that he's fully capable of stretching out and playing with intensity. But for about 75% of air cut, whenever he has a feature, he just basically states a melody and perhaps a variation. And that's it. Maybe he does more live. Yeah, that's possible. But really, Eddie Jobson is the hero of this album for keyboards and for violin. The songs on air cut cover a lot of genre space but Jobson's violin feels just as much at home in the 30s swing feel of world as it does in the full rock out instrumental Armin. Curved Air has a pretty diverse catalog for a group that have been recording for about 10 years roughly for the bulk of their best work, including their debut album, Air Conditioning, their second album, simply called Second Album, from 1971, Phantasmagoria from 1972, a favorite of a lot of progressive rock fans. Today's selection, Air Cut from 1973. Midnight Wire from 1975. 1976's Airborne, which includes the entry of Stuart Copeland and the exit, because he was quickly on his way to play with the police. And also a reunited Curved Air put out an album in 2014 called North Star. Final thoughts? Air Cut is okay. I think maybe they started out trying to make an album with commercial appeal, but couldn't help but succumb to their ambitious and adventurous tendencies. A couple of really good songs, some great moments, but mostly just okay. <laughs> <laughs> 